This afternoon, I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce one of my great intellectual heroes, Professor William Julius Wilson. Professor Wilson's work played a central role in discussions of inequality in any of the courses I taught at Holy Cross. That's no surprise given the role of his work nationally. He helped me and many others to think more clearly about the ways that social structures influence culture. Indeed, I cannot help reading and critiquing Harrington's work today on the basis of what I've learned from Professor Wilson. I understand the nature, nature of poverty in America differently because of his work. William Julius Wilson is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor at Harvard University. That designation, University Professor, is the highest professorial distinction for any fa Harvard faculty member. Professor Wilson has received 44 honorary degrees, has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, the American Philosophical Society, the Institute of Medicine, and the British Academy. He was awarded a MacArthur Prize Fellowship from 1987 to 92, received the National Medal of Science in 1998, and was awarded the Talcott Parsons Prize in the Social Sciences by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2001, he won the Ainfield Wolf Lifetime National Achievement Award. He's past president of the American Sociological Association. His many publications include The Declining Significance of Race, winner of the ASA's Sidney Spivak Award, The Truly Disadvantaged, which was selected by the editors of the New York Times Book Review as one of the 16 best books of 1987, and When Work Disappears, The World of the New Urban Poor, which received the Sidney Hillman Foundation Award in 1996. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor William Julius Wilson. I'm very pleased to, to be a speaker at this important conference. And the title of my talk is Toward a Holistic Study of Inner City Poverty, Why Both Social Structure and Culture Matter. Now, when Michael Harrington wrote uh, The Other America, uh, he, he estimated that roughly uh, one quarter of the U.S. population lived in poverty, and prominent among this group were inner city blacks, Appalachian whites, elderly Americans, and farm workers. And in my talk today, I want to focus on inner city poverty, one of Michael Harrington's central concerns, and in the process, address an issue that was not fully fleshed out in the other America. And that is the relationship between social structure and cultural behavior. Now, I focus on inner city blacks to elaborate my analytic framework because they have been the central focus of the structure versus culture dispute in the scholarly literature. So let me begin. Now, following the uh, publication of uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's classic study, The Affluent Society, generally acknowledged as providing the initial impetus to the revival of interest in poverty in the late 1950s came Michael Harrington's celebrated work, The Other America. And it was Harrington's passionate portrayal of the poor in America that actually launched the idea of poverty prominently into the public consciousness. Stimulated by Galbraith's study, Harrington argued that at least 40 million or a fifth of the population were poor, that much of this population was invisible because it included large numbers of children and the elderly, groups unlikely to stray far from home, as well as people of color who were, were becoming increasingly isolated in urban ghettos, that motivational de uh, deficiencies 
For example, fatalistic attitudes resulting from prolonged poverty were impeding the economic advancement of the poor, and therefore that poverty had become a vicious cycle for millions of Americans. Now, in a recent article in The Nation, Barbara Ehringreich, the noted author of the best-selling book, Nickel and Dimed, took the opportunity of the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary of the publication of The Other American to reflect on the book's impact. And she argued that the book helped perpetuate the notion, culture of poverty. And she stated that Harrington borrowed the concept from Oscar Lewis, who first used the term in his study of Mexican slum dwellers, and that Harrington's use of the term influenced later writings and conceptions about poverty, including books written by conservative social analysts, Michael Banfield and Charles Murray, who in effect argue that, or argue that poverty was not caused by structural factors such as low wages and lack of jobs, but by cultural deficiencies, including poor attitudes and problematic lifestyles. Aaron Wright argued that, quote, in his defense, Harrington did not mean that poverty was caused by what he called the twisted pro proclivities of the poor, but he certainly opened the floodgates to that interpretation, unquote. She goes on to state, and I quote, by the Reagan era, by the Reagan era, the culture of poverty had become a cornerstone of conservative ideology. Poverty was caused not by low wages or a lack of jobs, but by bad, bad attitudes and faulty lifestyles. The poor were promiscuous, prone to addiction and crime, unable to defer gratification, or possibly even set an alarm clock. The last thing they could be trusted with was money. In fact, Charles Murray argued in his 1984 book, Losing Ground, that any attempt to help the poor with their material circumstances would only have the unexpected consequence of deepening their depravity. Unquote. Now, what I find objectionable about Ehrenreich's piece is that she fails to make a clear distinction between how Harrington discussed and analyzed the culture of poverty and the way authors such as Banfield and Murray used the concept subsequently. A writer cannot always be held responsible for how his or her work is used or misused. For this reason, I think it was incumbent upon Ehrenreich to draw out in sharper relief the differences between Harrington and later writers like Banfield and Murray in the discussion of the culture of poverty. Basically, from my perspective, Harrington's discussion of the culture of poverty represents what the anthropologist Alf Hanards calls a cultural analysis of life in poverty. In other words, Michael Harrington's The Other America demonstrates that it is possible to recognize 
the importance of macrostructural constraints, that is, to avoid the extreme notion of a culture of poverty, as seen in the works of Banfield and Murray, and still see the merits of a more subtle kind of cultural analysis of life in poverty. Now, the purpose of my talk is to present a framework that draws this distinction out, a framework that integrates social structural forces ranging from those that are racial, such as segregation and discrimination, to those that are non-racial, such as impersonal changes in the economy, and cultural forces, such as shared outlooks, belief systems, values, skills, styles of presentation, and linguistic patterns. Cultural forces that emerge in settings created by discrimination and segregation. And I highlight two types of cultural traits relevant to the study of race and urban poverty. One represents national views and beliefs on race, and the other embodies patterns of intra-group interaction in settings created by discrimination and segregation and that reflect collective experiences within those settings. When we talk about the impact of cultural traits, we're also making explicit reference to the forces they set in motion, given specific social circumstances, which affect human behavior. Accordingly, I emphasize that distinct cultural traits in the inner city have not only been shaped, many of them have not only been shaped by race and poverty, but in turn often shape responses to poverty, including responses that may contribute to the perpetuation of poverty. Indeed, one of the effects of living in racially segregated neighborhoods is exposure to group-specific cultural traits, orientations, habits, and worldviews, as well as styles of behavior and particular skills, and the micro-level processes of meaning-making and decision-making. That is, the way that individuals and particular groups or communities develop an understanding of how the world works and make decisions based on that understanding. However, many liberal scholars are reluctant to discuss or research the role that culture plays in the negative outcomes found in the inner city. And it's possible that they fear being criticized for reinforcing the popular view that the negative social outcomes, poverty, unemployment, drug addiction, and crime of many poor people in the inner city are due to the shortcomings of the people themselves. Indeed, my colleague Orlando Patterson in the Department of Sociology at Harvard maintains that there is, and I quote him, a deep-seated dogma that has prevailed in social science and policy circles since the mid-1960s, the rejection of any explanation that invokes a group's cultural attributes, its distinctive attitudes, values, and tendencies, and the resulting behavior of its members, and the relentless preference for reliance on structural factors like low incomes, joblessness, poor schools, and bad housing, unquote. And Patterson claims that social scientists have shied away from cultural explanations of race and poverty because of the widespread belief that such explanations are tantamount to blaming the victim. That is, they support the conclusion 
that the poor themselves and not the social environment are responsible for their own poverty and negative social outcomes. And he contends that it is, quote, utterly bogus, unquote, to argue, as do many academics, that cultural explanations necessarily, underline necessarily blame the victim for poor social outcomes. Patterson argues that to hold an individual responsible for his behavior is not to rule out any consideration of the environmental factors, including historical environmental factors that may have evoked the questionable behavior to begin with. I fully agree. However, the use of a cultural argument is not without peril. Anyone who wishes to understand American society must be aware that explanations focusing on cultural traits of inner city residents are likely to draw far more attention from policymakers and the general public than structural explanations will. It's an unavoidable fact that Americans tend to de-emphasize the structural origins and the social significance of poverty and welfare. In other words, the popular view is that people are poor or on welfare because of their own personal shortcomings. A 2007 Pew Research Center survey revealed that fully two-thirds of all Americans believe that personal factors, rather than racial discrimination, explain why many African Americans have difficulty getting ahead in life. Just 19% blame discrimination. Nearly three-fourths of US whites, a majority of Hispanics, and even a slight majority of blacks believe that African Americans who have not gotten ahead in life are mainly responsible for their own situation. Now, the strength of American cultural sentiments that individuals are primarily responsible for poverty presents a dilemma for anyone like myself who seeks the most comprehensive explanation of outcomes for poor people of color. Why? Simply because, as noted previously, cultural arguments that focus on individual traits and behavior invariably draw more attention than do structural explanations in the United States. Accordingly, I feel that a social scientist has an obligation to try to make sure that the explanatory power of his or her structural argument is not lost to the reader and to provide a context for understanding cultural responses to chronic economic and racial subordination. Consider for example, the complex causal flow between structure and culture. In an, oppress in an impressive study that analyzes data from a national longitudinal survey with methods designed to measure intergenerational economic mobility, the sociologist Patrick Sharkey of New York University found that more than 70% of black children who are raised in the poorest quarter of American neighborhoods, the bottom 25% in terms of average neighborhood, average neighborhood income, will continue to live 
in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods as adults. More than 70%. He also found that since the 1970s, a majority of black families have resided in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods in consecutive generations, compared to only 7% of white families. Thus, he concludes that the disadvantages of living in poor black neighborhoods, like the advantages of living in affluent white neighborhoods, are in large measure inherited. And we should also consider another path-breaking study that Sharkey co-authored with senior investigator Robert Sampson, a Harvard University sociologist, that examined the effects of concentrated poverty on black children's verbal ability. And they studied a representative sample of 750 African-American children ages 6 and 12, 6 to 12, who were growing up in the city of Chicago in 1995 and followed them anywhere they moved in the United States for up to seven years. The children were given a reading examination and vocabulary test at three different periods. And their study shows that residing in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood cumulatively impedes the development of academically relevant verbal ability in children. And their results revealed, one, that the neighborhood environment is an important developmental context for trajectories of verb verbal cognitive ability. Two, that young African-American children who had earlier lived in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood had fallen behind their counterparts or peers who had not resided previously in disadvantaged areas by up to six, I, six IQ points, a magnitude estimated to be equivalent to missing a year or more of schooling. And three, that the strongest effects, the strongest effects appeared several years, several years after children live in areas of concentrated disadvantage. <coughs> now this research raises important questions about ways in which neighborhoods may alter growth and verbal ability, producing effects that linger on even if a child leaves a severely disadvantaged neighborhood. Now, children's verbal ability certainly has consequences for school performances, including the completion of high school. A study by Jeffrey Watke, David Harding, and Philip Ewart using panel study of income dynamics, the longitudinal study that Sharkey used, Examine the effects of long-term exposure to disadvantaged neighborhoods on high school graduation. And they tracked, followed longitudinally, 4,154 children by measuring their neighborhood context once each year from age 1 to 17 and found that continuous exposure to disadvantaged neighborhoods featuring high rates of poverty, unemployment, female-headed households and welfare receipt, as well as few well-educated adults, throughout the entire childhood life course has a devastating impact on the chances of graduating from high school. And the author stated that their findings, which reveal the cumulative impact of growing up in the country's most disadvantaged communities, are consistent with my arguments regarding the consequences of spatially, spatially concentrated poverty. Now, here's a point I want to make. 
These studies suggest that neighborhood effects are not solely structural. Among the effects of living in segregated neighborhoods over extended periods is repeated exposure to cultural traits that emanate from or are the products of racial exclusion. Traits such as verbal skills that may impede successful maneuvering in the larger society. As Sharkey points out, and I quote, when we consider that the vast majority of black families living in America's poorest neighborhoods come from families that have lived in similar environments for generations, continuity of the neighborhood environment in addition to continuity of economic, or I should say individual economic status, may be especially relevant to the study of cultural patterns among disadvantaged populations, unquote. Now, unfortunately, very little research attention has been given to these cumulative cultural experiences. And it is sometimes difficult to separate cumulative cultural experiences from cumulative psychological experiences. Take, for example, repeated experiences of discrimination and disrespect that a lot of blacks share in common. Now, if these experiences are systematic over an extended time period, they can generate common psychological states that may be interpreted as norms by social investigators because they seem to regulate patterns of behavior. Resignation as a response to repeated experiences with discrimination and disrespect is one good example. Parents in segregated communities who have had such experiences may transmit to children through the process of socialization a set of beliefs about what to expect from life and how one should respond to life circumstances. In other words, children may be taught norms of resignation. They observe the behavior of adults and learn the, quote, appropriate, unquote, actions or response in different situations independently of their own direct experiences. In the process, children may acquire a disposition to interpret the way the world works that reflects a strong sense that other members of society disrespect them because they are black. The impact of chronic economic subordination and displays of disrespect on people's psychological inclinations and emotional states may partly depend on the cultural resources they have to interpret what has happened to them, such as a cultural framing designed to fend off the insults that promote strong feelings of racial pride within the community. Now, over time, the shared psychological inclinations can become crystallized in cultural products and practices. Thus, what I'm trying to say is that in addition to structural influences, exposure to different cultural influences in the neighborhood over time has to be taken into account if one is to really appreciate and explain the divergent social outcomes of human groups. And this reminds me that it wasn't until I attended a panel discussion at the University of Chicago in 1995 on Richard Herrnstein and Charles Murray's controversial book, The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class in American Life, that I saw the most compelling reason for combining cultural arguments with structural arguments in order to construct a truly comprehensive explanation of the social and economic outcomes of poor blacks. 
In the bell curve, Hernstein and Murray found differences in the test scores of blacks and whites, even after they had included social environmental factors such as family education, father's occupation, and household income in their analyses. And they use this difference in test scores to support the argument that the social and economic outcomes of blacks differ at least in part because of genetic endowment, a position that suggests that African Americans are innately uh, inferior. Now, to my mind, none of the panelists gathered that day at the University of Chicago provided a satisfactory rebuttal. And I left the discussion thinking that Hernstein and Murray's arguments for the importance of group differences and cognitive ability was based on an incredibly weak measure of the social environment. In other words, simply controlling for differences in family education, father's occupation, and household income hardly captures differences in cumulative social environmental experiences. Hernstein and Murray did not provide measures of the cumulative effects of race, including the effects of prolonged residence in racially segregated neighborhoods. Now, I just discussed the recent groundbreaking Longitudinal studies have revealed that these cumulative effects are both structural and cultural. Unfortunately, such studies were not available at the time of the contentious debates over the bell curve. Thus, in addition to structural influences, exposure to different cultural influences in the neighborhood environment over time has to be taken into account if one is to really appreciate and explain the divergent social outcomes of human groups. But to repeat, in delivering this message, we must make sure that the powerful influence of structural factors do not recede into the background. Indeed, a fundamental question remains. What is the relative importance of these two dimensions in accounting for social outcomes? Culture matters but I would have to say it does not matter nearly as much as social structure. From a historical perspective, it is hard to overstate the importance of racialist structural factors that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fought so hard against. Aside from the enduring effects of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, public school segregation, legalized discrimination, residential segregation, the FHA's redlining of black neighborhoods in the 1940s and 1950s, the construction of public housing projects in poor black neighbors, neighborhoods, employer discrimination, and other racial acts and processes. There is the impact of political, economic, and policy decisions that were at least partly influenced by race. In contrasting the combined impact of the structural factors with cultural factors, it would be very hard to argue that the cultural factors in the poor black community are equally as important in determining life chances or creating racial group outcomes. For example, the sharp decline in employment in many inner city neighborhoods cannot be explained using cultural arguments. One of the explanations for this rise in joblessness relates to the interaction of demographic and economic changes. In the last quarter of the 20th century, federal transportation and highway policies made it easier for industries to relocate to cheaper labor production areas in the suburbs. And the out-migration of industries was accompanied by the out-migration of higher income families to the suburbs aided by mortgage interest tax exemptions and home mortgages for veterans. The improved transportation and suburbanization of employment accelerated the out-migration of central city manufacturing. With manufacturing jobs no longer readily available in central city and inner city areas, the great 
black migration, the great migration wave of blacks from the south to the northern urban areas abruptly ended around 1970. So with the secession of migration from the south and the out-migration of higher income families, many poor black inner city neighborhoods, especially those in the Midwest and Northeast, changed from densely populated communities of recently arrived migrants to depopulated areas with numerous vacant lots and abandoned buildings. For example, today there are 60,000 abandoned buildings in Philadelphia, 40,000 in Detroit, 20,000 in Baltimore, most in these inner city areas. In addition, the end of the great migration from the South and the out-migration of higher income families, because of this you also see a much larger proportion of poor families and significantly higher levels of joblessness, in part due to the exodus of higher income families who are more likely to be employed, in part due to the decline of industrial employment in the inner city, as well as the decline of local businesses that depend on the resources of higher income groups, many of whom had departed. To make matters worse for the families left behind in these neighborhoods, urban sprawl makes it more difficult for many of them to get to areas of, of, of employment growth, given the inadequate metropolitan transit systems. Commuters depend more on automobiles to get to employment area. And our study in Chicago revealed that only 19% of the residents in Chicago's inner city ghetto neighborhoods have access to an automobile. Now this is a major problem because the suburbs of many central cities developed originally as bedroom localities for commuters to the central business and manufacturing districts have become employment centers in themselves. For example, in Detroit, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, less than 20% of the jobs are now located within three miles of the city center. In the Cleveland metropolitan area, although entry-level workers are concentrated in the inner city neighborhoods, 80% of the entry-level jobs are in the suburbs. Moreover, the breakdown of the informal job network system, which is associ associated with a sharp rise in joblessness, makes it difficult for inner city residents to gain information about suburban job opportunities through the informal network, including job referrals. Jobless neighborhoods create special problems exacerbating conditions that reinforce racial stereotypes and prejudices. High rates of joblessness trigger other problems in a neighborhood, ranging from crime, gang violence, and drug trafficking to family breakup and the organization of family life. Take drug trafficking. As I pointed out in my book, When Work Disappears, Many studies have revealed an association between a decline in legitimate employment opportunities among inner city residents and increased incentives to sell drugs. In neighborhoods plagued by high levels of joblessness, insufficient economic opportunities, and high residential mobility are unable to control the volatile drug market and the violent crimes related to it. As a result, the behavior and norms in the drug market are more likely to influence the actions of others in the neighborhood, even those who are not directly involved in drug activity. Drug dealers escalate the use and spread of guns in the neighborhood, which in turn raises the likelihood that others, particularly youngsters, will come to view the possession of weapons as necessary or desirable for self-protection, settling disputes, gaining respect from, from, from peers and other individuals. Indeed, one of the reasons why I want my students to watch HBO's The Wire, W-I-R-E, 
Watch it if you haven't seen it. Go buy the DVDs. It's no longer on HBO. You go buy the DVDs. Oh, I don't want to get started on that. It's the greatest show ever, believe me. <laughs> One of the reasons why I wanted my students to watch HBO's The Wire is because the show brilliantly captures this process. Moreover, as a criminologist Alfred Bloomstein pointed out, and as was depicted so clearly in HBO's The Wire, the drug industry actively recruits teenagers in the neighborhood, partly because they will work more cheaply and partly because they tend to be more daring and willing to take risks that more mature adults would eschew. Inner-city black youths with limited prospects for stable and attractive employment are easily lured into drug trafficking and therefore easily find themselves involved in the violent behavior that accompanies it. Many of these youngsters are high school dropouts. And as my Harvard colleague Bruce Western revealed, which is, he was here this morning, in his important book, Punishment and Inequality in America, Following the collapse of the low-skilled urban labor markets and the creation of jobless ghettos in our nation's inner cities, incarceration grew among those with the highest jobless rates. Indeed, a significant proportion of black males who have been in prison are high school dropouts. As Western points out, quote, among black high school dropouts, male high school dropouts, the risk of imprisonment has increased to 60%, establishing incarceration as a normal stopping point on the road to midlife, unquote. All of this is clearly depicted in HBO's The Wire. Now, policymakers who are dedicated to combating the problems of race and poverty and who recognize the importance of structural inequities face an important challenge. Namely, how to generate political support from, from Americans who tend to place far more emphasis on cultural factors and individual behavior than on structural impediments in explaining social and economic outcomes. After all, beliefs that attribute joblessness and poverty to individual shortcomings do not engender strong support for social programs to end inequality. Nonetheless, in addressing the problem of structural inequities, it would not be wise to leave the impression in public discussion that cultural problems do not matter. Indeed, proposals to address racial inequality should reflect awareness of the inextricable link between aspects of structure and culture. Now, my analysis suggests the need for a holistic public policy perspective, whereby the complex web of structural and cultural factors that create and reinforce racial inequality are reinforced and appreciated. And I would like to conclude my lecture by briefly discussing a very successful program that epitomizes the type of holistic approach I have in mind, the Harlem Children's Zone. Now, the Harlem Children's Zone attempts to achieve what the social philosopher James Fiskin calls equality of life chances. Equality of life chances. According to this principle, if we can predict with a high degree of accuracy where individuals will end up in the competition for preferred positions in society, merely by knowing their family background, race, or gender, then the conditions that affect or determine their motivations and talents are grossly unequal. Supporters of this principle, equality of life chances, believe that a person should not be able to enter a hospital ward of healthy newborn babies and accurately predict their eventual social and economic position in society solely on the basis of their race and or economic class origins. Unfortunately, in many urban neighborhoods in the United States, you can accurately make such predictions. Supporters of the principle of equality of life chances feel that it is unfair 
that some individuals in our society receive every conceivable advantage, while others, from the day they are born, never really have a chance to develop their talents. And I was thinking about such children when their previous speakers were talking about the plight of children, uh, farm workers. The Harlem Children's Zone was developed by the visionary Jeffrey Canada, whose mission was to flood a number of blocks in Harlem, an inner city community in New York City, with educational, social, and medical services to create a comprehensive safety net for the children in that area. More specifically, the Harlem Children's Zone is a 97-block laboratory in central Harlem that combines two reform-oriented public charter schools with a web of community services designed for children from birth to college graduation in order to provide a supportive and positive social environment outside the school. Now, Jeffrey Canada was able to get corporate leaders to support him. In 2009, the Harlem Children's Zone had nearly $200 million in assets and a fiscal year budget of roughly $84 million, two-thirds of which is based on corporate funding. The Harlem Children's Zone features over 20 programs they represent community investments to help empower individuals who live in these 97 blocks. Included in these investments are childhood programs, such as Head Start, after school programs, such as tutoring, dance, and karate, and family health and community programs. One notable community initiative that represents a cultural initiative is a baby college, which is a nine-week workshop for expectant parents and those with children up to the age of three that teaches these parents essential skills like reading to children, the importance of prenatal care, and alternatives to physical discipline. The curriculum is based on the writings and counsel of the pediatrician T. Barry Brazelton and includes subjects that range from handling parental stress to discipline and parent-child bonding. Harlem Gems is another major community initiative, an all-day pre-kindergarten pre program with a four-to-one child-to-adult ratio that is designed to develop the language and pre-literacy skills students need in kindergarten. The school investment programs feature the Promise Academy public charter schools. The first academy, Promise Academy One, was opened in 2004 with elementary and middle schools. And the second academy, Promise Academy II, was opened in the fall of 2005 with an elementary school. Both academies will eventually reach a full K-12 to set of grades, taking on a new grade each year. Students who enter the program are selected by lottery. Now, there is evidence suggesting the effectiveness of the Harlem Children's Zone. Its after-school office has helped place 650 students in college and the program supports these students until they graduate from college. Its asthma initiative includes 1,000 participants, and the program has drastically reduced their missing school days and emergency visits. In the Harlem Gems program, for six straight years, 100% of pre-kindergartners were school ready. Of the parents who attended the baby college, 81% report that they read to their children more often than they had done in the past. This represents a change in cultural behavior. Finally, parent satisfaction in the Promise Academy public charter schools, as measured by the city of New York, is extremely high. However, the most impressive evidence is seen in the performance of students in the Harlem Children's Zone's Promise Academies on a New York statewide math and English test. When the tests were given in 2009, the kids from the Promise Academies, children from some of the most impoverished backgrounds, and mostly from poor single-parent families, had scores on the cognitive tests 
that far exceeded those of children in the traditional public schools of New York, so much so that they closed the black-white achievement gap in mathematics and reduced it about half in the English language arts test. However, the results were even more spectacular for students in the Promise Academy elementary schools, students who benefited from entering the Promise Academies when they were in kindergarten. The elementary school students closed the black-white achievement gap in both mathematics and English language arts. The closing of the English language arts gap in elementary schools and significantly reducing it in middle schools are especially noteworthy achievements because as I indicated previously, careful research reveals that living in poor segregated neighborhoods for extended periods of time has an adverse effect on verbal ability as measured by the cognitive test. And these effects linger, linger on even after children leave these neighborhoods. So it is much more difficult to overcome the effects of living in chronically economic, economically poor segregated neighborhoods on the verbal skills of older children. Nonetheless, even the English language art scores of students in the Harlem Children's Zone were significantly higher than those in the traditional public schools. And to repeat, the English language art scores for those in the academy's elementary schools were especially dramatic. However, when the state of New York made its exams more difficult in 2010, scores dropped in the Promise Academies as they did all over the city and state of New York. Although both Harlem School Harlem Children's Own Schools outperformed the city as a whole in both math and English. And now Jeff Canada and his staff have decided to select children for this program from a lottery at the time they are born. And as this program continues, the English language art scores will undoubtedly improve significantly for those beyond elementary school because they will have had the benefit of the earliest exposure to the Harlem Children's Zone. Now this is very important because beginning at the earliest point in a child's life would be an effective way to offset the cumulative effects of living in poor segregated neighborhoods. Finally, it should be noted that in a given calendar year, Promise, Promise Academy students are in school at least 50% more than a traditional public school student. And this includes an extended school day with coordinated after school tutoring and additional classes on Saturday for students who need remediation in English language arts and mathematics skills and a relatively short summer vacation. And I might add parenthetically talking about a short summer vacation. Research reveals that the racial achievement score gap widens dramatically during the summer months because whereas inner city black kids go home and watch TV due to limited parental financial resources during the summer, kids from more advantaged families go to summer camp and enjoy other kinds of enrichment programs. However, the students in the Promise Academies continue to receive intellectual stimulation during the summer months because they have a brief summer vacation, only three weeks. Nonetheless, despite the longer school hours, the lottery winners have fewer absences in every grade than the control group of lottery losers who attend who had to attend the traditional public schools in New York City. Now I wish Michael Harrington, who called for a comprehensive intervention to combat poverty, were alive today to see this program. Because the Harlem Children's Zone clearly demonstrates that with sufficient resources, and dedication, it is possible to achieve the goal of equality of life chances in this country and thereby overcome the cumulative effects of chronic, economic, and racial subordination. Thank you.
Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Gavin O'Brien from Brandeis, and um, you talk mostly about inner city poverty. Um, and I had seen in the latest census data that um, a lot of the poverty increase is now happening um, outside of the inner cities. And I was wondering if you saw that as a different kind of poverty that needs a different approach from inner city poverty in areas of concentrated uh, disadvantage. Yeah, you're referring to the uh, Brookings Institution study. A lot of this increase in poverty in the suburbs is taking place in what we call inner ring suburbs. And if you look at the data that uh, Bruce Katz of the Brookings Institution and his colleagues have uh, gathered, you will see that um, inner ring suburban poverty is quite similar to inner city ghetto poverty in terms of the percentage of people who are in poverty and joblessness and other problems associated with uh, poverty. Uh, but studies uh, are also reveal, I'm talking about a study at Stanford now, that uh, uh, poverty is spreading in other parts of the suburbs, not necessarily in the inner ring suburbs. And I haven't had a chance to look closely at that data. But if I were just comparing inner city ring suburban poverty with uh, 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 inner city ghetto poverty, I would say that uh, poverty is very similar and the solutions would be very similar. I would love to see some um, promise neighborhoods that are modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone in both a number of inner city ghetto neighborhoods and inner ring suburbs. I forgot to mention that, you know, the Obama administration, very impressed with the Harlem Children's Zone, created this, uh, this, this, this program called Promise Neighborhoods, which is patterned after the Harlem Children's Zone. And the, the design was, was to create 20 such programs across the country. They'd be pilot programs that might provide the basis eventually for uh, upscaling this to uh, a really comprehensive national program, scaling it up to a truly comp comprehensive national program. Um, and what he initially had in mind was uh, a consortium of funding, including private foundations, corporations, and the government. Um, and the initial budget was just cut back severely by the, by the House. It survived. The program is still alive. I mean, they, they actually have funded some uh, in, uh, initial programs, uh, pilot programs, but they really don't have the resources or the money to accomplish anything as far as I'm concerned. But I would love to see I would love to see uh, resources made available so that we could really duplicate what Jeff Canada has done in Harlem on a wider scale. What's your opinion on the Race to the Top program? Well, you know, it's interesting that if you look at the the um, health initiative, it's gotten so much publicity and criticism because it's, it's so visible. The Race to the Top initiative hasn't gotten nearly as much coverage, and I think that Arne Duncan has been able to accomplish more. I support the Race to the Top initiative because it has led to some really significant changes in a number of cities. For example, like the city of Boston. I don't have time to elaborate on what has been accomplished. But some really significant improvements that have occurred in Boston, have occurred in Washington, D.C. because of race to the top. You see, uh, the Obama administration <coughs> included about $100 billion for education from the stimulus package. And he used, Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education, used that money as a leverage to um, promote school reform and also including um, promoting competition among the schools. And one of the things they did was they threatened states with reduced funding if they did not allow charter schools to flourish. 
Now the point was is that charter schools could therefore compete with public schools and generate the kind of competition that might eventually lead to improved education, uh, not only in the charter schools, but in the, uh, the non-charter public schools. And you see this happening in Boston. But it has also led to some fundamental changes, for example, in Washington, D.C., where uh, Michelle Ree, the former chancellor of the school system there, uh, use the Race to the Top initiative to go to the state, go to the, uh, to the legislature, uh, to the uh, district government, uh, to um, in, in, introduce a program that would reward teachers on the basis of performance in the classroom. You see, a lot of teachers in inner city schools are not doing the job. A lot of inner city schools are dumping grounds for some of the worst teachers, and it's damn hard to fire them. But Michelle Reed did. She got rid of them, and she's been soundly criticized. But I tell you, if you look at some of the accomplishments in Washington, D.C., you have to admit that she, uh, she achieved a great deal, and uh, the program is still in place. So I am not a critic of Race to the Top. And I am a big fan of Arne Duncan. There's nobody more committed to improving public education uh, than Arne Duncan. I thought it was a brilliant idea when Mayor Daley selected him as the CEO of the uh, public schools in Chicago. And it was a brilliant move when Obama appointed him Secretary of Education. I know Arne Duncan. He used to sit in my living room. You know, talking about issues. I know how dedicated he is. I'm sorry to get off on all of that. But yes, I'm a big fan of Ways to the Top. Um, my name's Molly. I'm from Brandeis. I'm an MPP student. And um, my question is that the Harlem Children's Zone is often shown as the shining beacon of the example to use, but it's also very place-based. Um, so what, how would you respond to that? I know it's a very widely circulated argument. And secondly, um, if if you are a town or a city and you're trying to replicate this model and you don't have all the funds, you don't have all the coordination that, that Harlem has, where do you start? What do you think is the one place to focus on if you have to pick one? Well, I think that's a very good question. Uh, it may be place-based, but one of the things that the Obama administration did with their um, Promised Neighborhoods initiative is to have the program in different places across the country not just one area, uh, 20 different places across the country. It's awfully difficult to raise money, the sufficient funds, just for relying, for example, on federal dollars right now, given the budget deficit. So what Obama has been trying to encourage uh, community leaders to do is to work with private foundations and corporate leaders in their particular cities to develop such programs. And uh, they're trying to do that in Boston and trying to do it in a number of other cities. Um, but it really, right now, given uh, the uh, state of the, uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, Congress and the budget deficit, uh, if these programs are going to get off the ground in the very near future, you ha you're, you're going to have to have a coalition consortium of funding that would include corporate funding and funding from private foundations as well as government funding. Hi, Dr. Wilson. I'm Debbie Ackerson. The Harlem Children's Zone, how did they deal with the lottery? And if did it apply to one whole family or individuals in the family? And if it were individuals, how did they address? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Jeffrey Canada, if you ever saw this film on the Harlem Children's Zone, he, he was all, he's always depressed. Uh, when they announced the winners of the lottery because you could just see the faces of the families who did not win, the lottery losers. And in some cases, you have uh, one child in the family going to the Harlem Children's Zone and other children going to the traditional public schools. Um, and he would love he, to be able to include all the children of Harlem or at least all the children in his uh, zone in the uh, public charter schools, but he can't. Uh, 
So what happens is that the students who are lucky enough to get in thrive. The other students go to the public schools. But they do benefit from other services in the area. And there is now a study underway to see the extent to which the package of services, including health services, uh, benefit these children, or whether or not there's a reduction in a number of uh, problems such as teenage pregnancy and, and gang behavior and so on. But unfortunately, only a fraction of the students benefit from the public charter schools. Um, hi, um, I'm Eldico Kemp I'm from Brandeis University. Um, uh, well, first of all, um, I grew up in Manhattan, so um, when you're talking about the math and the ELA, the English language uh, tests, yeah. um, in, in New York, if, even if you want to go to the worst school, you need to apply in middle school and in high school. And what most of those applications are based on, the ones that aren't lottery based, they're based on your ELA scores. In order to get into the most prestigious middle schools and then also the most prestigious high schools, a big important factor is that you get double fours. Fours are the highest you can get. It's one to four. You need to get double fours on those tests. Um, so that, I guess, I hope that gives more of a perspective of how important it is that you know these inner city kids are, you know, achieving, um, you know, those uh, scores because, you know, going to a middle, uh, getting into good middle school means you go to a right. good high school, and then a good high school is a good college. Right. Um, no, and then I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I also had a question. Um, you mentioned. Well, a before lot. you answer that question, let me just respond to what you just said. This reminds me that. Uh, we ask, uh, I was talking about the Race at the Top initiative, and reminds me that um, the, uh, there are some public charter schools that are not doing the job, but there are others that are really very, very successful, particularly the public charter schools in New York and Boston. Take New York, for example. Uh, only 4% of the children in the New York public charter schools are white. They're overwhelmingly black and Hispanic. Yet, the kids in the charter schools, their scores on the cognitive tests match those of white kids in suburbia. I mean, it just, it's, it's really incredible uh, what uh, the public charter schools in New York have done. And they're also very, very successful in Boston. That uh, just reminded me. Go ahead. Right. Um, and then I had a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, structural and cultural. Yes. Um, Attributes. Um, I was wondering what you thought um, about ideological attributes and the fact that um, in America we're very much brought up to believe that America is a meritocracy and that if you're not successful in life, it's because you don't have the skills. It's because you're not working hard enough. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought of that. Well, that's uh, uh, you know the American belief system is something that we really have to overcome, and that's why I said in my talk that. Uh, a scholar like me who feels a need to come up with the most comprehensive explanation of race and urban poverty has to be aware that the dominant American belief system uh, will mean that individuals will listen more closely to the cultural arguments because they resonate with this, uh, uh, with this belief system. So this is something that has to be overcome. But you know, it's interesting. I believe we're beginning now to move slightly away from solely cultural arguments, and I, I attribute the Occupy movement. I think they have helped to generate more concern about some of these structural factors. You know, if you compare the attitudes toward poverty and joblessness during the Great Depression with the attitudes today, you see significant differences. During the Great Depression, it's quite clear that people were struggling because of the economy. And that's what people were focusing on. They weren't focusing on personal traits. They were talking about lack of jobs and so on. Now, I think with the economy in a downturn, prolonged downturn, although there's some evidence that there's a gradual recovery, 
uh, now is the time to begin to emphasize these structural factors more because I think people can relate more to these arguments because they are struggling now. And I really uh, thank the Occupy movement for creating an awareness of some of these structural factors. Yes, sir. Hi again. Uh, my name is Sahar Masachi. I'm from Brandeis and also Occupy DC. Uh, so thank you. Um, there is an argument that gets played out a lot in my circle of friends. And my girlfriend and my best friend girlfriend uh, both studied as teachers. And they spent four years taking 17 classes and one uh, full semester internship to learn how to be a teacher. Uh, a few of my other friends spent six weeks at Teach for America boot camp. And um, my teacher friends are quite upset that they will have a hard time getting jobs that Teach for America people will, will take from them. On the other hand, I'm really glad that uh, you know a certain class of people will go to do Teach for America as opposed to Goldman Sachs. And I was wondering just what's your thought on TFA, please? Well, I'm not an expert on education, but I do know that on just the basis of talking to some of my students uh, at the Kennedy School that uh, many of them were involved in Teach for America, that some of them do a really credible job. Uh, but then they say the problem is a lot of these kids, they come in and they teach for a couple of years and then they, didn't, then they just leave. And so you have the problem of uh, sustained uh, teaching and, and, and contact uh, with students. But if you can encourage bright kids to go into education, that would be fantastic. If you could encourage kids who, who ordinarily would go into finance, you know, and business and so on, to go into education, maybe through, funnel them through Teach for America, that would be fantastic. But we've got to find some way to keep them there once they enter. And that's the problem I have with Teach for America. It's not, the involvement is not sustained. It's we'll go just a few years and, and then they leave. Very sorry to hear this story about your teachers who study so long and then now they have to compete. Um, is that really true that they're competing with Teach for America kids? Or is that yeah. anecdotal? Um, that's what they tell me. They say they want to get jobs at specific schools and those schools have TFA slots I open. I see, yeah, well. What can you say? <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you for your presentation. My name is Jerry, I work at the college here, and I had a question about encouraging volunteerism. You talked about the consortium and the need for resources. Yeah. What, what is the most efficacious focus for community organizations, faith organizations, uh, the United Way groups, um, to send volunteers into these areas? Should it be tutoring? Should it be health education? What, what do you see as some of the bigger needs where the grassroots people who want to do something good in the community who aren't necessarily going to be part of the, the private consortium funding or whatever, but they can spend a couple hours a week doing something. What, what do you think volunteers should be in, in a, in a, in a cross-sector type of way? What do, people, what, do the, um, what do these communities need from, from people just who are willing to spend some time and help them out? Well, you need just about everything. Uh, certainly tutorial help. And a lot of the students at Harvard uh, uh, work in a number of, uh, in, I don't know, a lot of students, uh, have some of my undergraduate students in the sociology department uh, are doing uh, tutorial work uh, in the high schools. Um, I would, uh, some of the community leaders have benefited from um, corporate people who have a consciousness and they're doing work pro bono, you know, working in these schools. Uh, some of them are teaching computer skills and so on. Um, others are involved in other types of uh, programs of education. Uh, I would just encourage, because these, pro these, these neighborhoods are so impoverished uh, and resources are so limited, uh, there just could be a range of things, uh, ranging from um, 
uh, tutorial work to, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking like the, the pro bono people from, uh, from the corporations who are working in some of the schools in Chicago and in New York. Uh, some of them are actually uh, filling in, helping teachers in the classroom with mathematics and, and computer skills. And others are uh, working with the uh, administration on budgets and so on. I mean, just, just a whole range of things that people can do. Um, but basically, my students have been working with uh, tutoring people uh, on various uh, subjects and also just being a big brother and a big sister, you know, and taking them out to different things and educational programs. And some of them were even involved in raising money to take them to Europe to get exposure to different uh, uh, cultures. Mine is kind of going off of your question as well. Um, and I think you might have answered it at the end with big, big brother, big sister. Um, pardon my ignorance on the topic. Um, I'm not very familiar with the programs that you've been discussing. but. Um, I would like to know, um, you mentioned that students that go through like the, Har uh, the Promise Academy or the program, the uh, Harlem Children's Zone, um, they're thriving. Um, what exactly do you mean by this? They're going off to college and they're, you know, they're doing well, they're becoming successful. And if so, what are they doing um, or what is the program doing with regards to maintaining ties with those with those students and um, trying to generate a sense of community, like equity building and them coming back to inspire the students that are, um, you know, their successors and um, just kind of creating an overall like sense of in, like um, building the community. And, you know, if these students are being are successful, um, or successfully incorporated into the workforce, working at places like Goldman Sachs or whatever, making money, are they try? I mean, are you trying to recruit them for like um, possibly helping to sponsor the program and give back in that way? Well, that's a good question. Let me just say that one of the things that um, Jeffrey Canada is concerned about is that he wants people who are talking about evaluating the program to consider the long-term impact of. Uh, the Harlem Children's Zone, and he said that uh, this program just started several years ago and that uh, uh, many of the kids in college have not graduated yet, uh, but he was hopeful that some of these kids will come back and even work with uh, him in the Harlem Children's Zone. And I would think that if some of these students go on and do join places like, uh, do become uh, part of the corporate sector and uh, in our um, organizations like uh, Goldman Sachs, that. Uh, they would uh, use uh, their position and influence to uh, help fund these programs. Uh, yeah, the thing is, is that Jeffrey Canada and the Harlem Children's Zone is following the students very, very closely. They remain in content, contact with them even when they go to college. And he says he wants to keep in contact with them after they graduate from college so that you will have an alumni and maybe get a powerful alumni force that they could draw upon to help promote the program. Last question. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm a truly believer of the charter schools. Mm -hmm. My children went to a charter school in Somerville. However, um, I feel that um, if public schools had the components that Jeffrey has in Harlem, which is the social and health services, um, these problems would not probably be as, you know, would not be impacting the children in uh, low-income communities. But uh, yesterday we were talking about the decrease in, in unions and the outsourcing of jobs, and therefore the unions had declined in the United States. And one of the issues with charter schools is about um, the lack of, um, they don't, they're not allowed to unionize and that's I think is um, a problem because a lot of the charter schools teachers they come to teach the two years and then they leave so um, I wonder what your perspective is about the union, unionizing. So you had to allow, allow this guy to ask the, the last question last which one. is a tough one. <laughs> <laughs>
Right, okay. First of all, let me just say this, that I'm a union man. I'm a strong supporter. I'm a strong supporter of unions, and one of the reasons why we have this rising income inequality in American society is because of the decline of unions. And uh, unions used to provide the basic support for workers that uh, enabled them to advance, but uh, the sharp decline in unions has resulted in the, is related to the increase in uh, income uh, inequality. That said, I have been extremely frustrated with the behavior of some of the teachers' unions. The fact that their support, even some of the worst teachers. I mentioned that a lot of these inner city schools have become dumping grounds for some of the worst teachers. These teachers are protected. And they're allowed to continue to educate and cripple these kids. They're protected by the teachers' unions, and the unions have resisted, for the most part, significant steps to improve the situation. One way you improve the situation is reward teachers for outstanding performances in the classroom. Now, I'll put aside the question about how do we measure outstanding performance. But there ought to be some way that you can reward the teachers who are doing the job, that you can make a distinction between the effective teachers and the worst teachers. But the way the situation is, is that you're rewarded now primarily based on seniority, not on how effective you are in the classroom. Now, I mentioned Washington, D.C. and Michelle Reed. Well, she was able to get through a program, despite union opposition, which would reward the best teachers. And uh, they get bonuses for their performances in the classroom. They get bonuses, uh, 10,000, sometimes 20,000 on top of their, their salaries. And so there's greater competition and greater effort on, on, on the part of the teachers to uh, um, compete for these, uh, for these uh, uh, bonuses. This, she was able to achieve this despite union opposition because unions did not want to change the seniority rules. Now, you mentioned Jeff Canada's school. Jeff Canada doesn't have to deal with unions in the public charter school. And that's why he was able to reduce the, uh, the summer school vacation to three weeks and also extend the school day. If he had unions, he wouldn't have been able to do that. Now, there, there, there are good points and bad points associated with that, all right? But the fact of the matter is, is that I would love to see unions cooperate more with superintendents and school principals in working effectively to enhance the education of students. And they have not done that. And if I'm critical of unions, it's the teachers' unions. I would love to see them. Teachers' unions are important. They have to, teachers, schools have to have unions. But I would love to see the teacher, the, the, the heads of the teachers' unions working more closely with the school principals in enhancing, in trying to enhance or improve the education of the students. And we haven't seen that for the most part. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um, I agree and disagree. Okay. Where do you disagree with? I disagree um, because I think that by um, following um, Jeff's um, model, um, there's, um, you impose on um, making people work sometimes more hours with the same pay. And we need to that, that I agree with. Now, what I would like to see, i tell you what, I would like to see a situation where if teachers are working longer hours, they're paid for it. Right. If they're working in the summertime, they're paid even more. That's what I would love to see. And, I, and if unions could agree to do that for teachers who work the longer hours so that, uh, because there's very good research that shows that uh, the longer these kids are in school, the uh, uh, better they do. As long as uh, uh, that research um, 
supports such an idea. I would uh, love to see the teachers unions work with, uh, with the principals and the school boards in increasing the pay scales for teachers who are involved in after school teaching and summer school teaching. This is what I would love to see. Well, that's an issue. yeah, that's an issue, and okay, I agree. All right. <laughs> okay.